Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's really my great pleasure to uh, host Ken Church. And Ken is a very, is definitely world class uh, um, research scientist. Currently, he's a chief scientist in the uh, Home Language Technology Center of Excellence in Johns Hopkins University. Before, he was a principal researcher in MSR. <coughs> So do I start now or do I yeah, wait until you tell me? Okay, so I can start now. Okay, fine. So um, you, I mean, it's probably a little weird where the where I'm the with. I'm not the the uh, this this isn't really my talk. Okay, um, let me give a little bit of a background. That is, um, um, we have to do a quarterly review, a dog and pony show, every quarter forever, and um, it's kind of hard for a group our size to do that, and and it's to the same audience every quarter. And how do you get them to want to come and listen, spend the whole day listening to us every quarter? And, you know, we, we produce a lot, but not that much. Um, okay. So one of the things that we've been doing a lot is we're hiring a lot of people. We hired four people last year, including me, and we're probably going to on a roll to do even more this year. Um, it's good to be expanding in a down market. Um, anyway, so what we do for the quarterly review, and when you hire four people, it's a really simple formula. We have a newbie talk every time we get the newest guy to come up and give a talk on what he does and introduce himself and so on. And so I'm going to give the newbie talk that he gave because it was a really good newbie talk. Um, okay, and I'm the sort of with and, and well, one of a bunch of withs. The last two withs are graduate students with Hennick um, at the university. Hennick is a professor on the university, and um, you probably don't all know him, but um, I guess you mostly know who I am. Um, and Aaron, you probably don't know, but the point of a newbie talk is to introduce you to a guy you should know. Okay, um, So I'll do that. Um, let me describe a little bit about how, what Hennick is, which is when I want to describe what a speech recognition uh, system is, and, and part of my job is I get to do things like describe that to people who don't know. All right. Um, but I, I described it um, this way. Um, this is the Hopkins view of speech recognition. Um, okay. It, it's not quite the same as yours. You'll see. You can comment on two. Let me give it, and then you could say whether or not Microsoft endorses it. Okay. All right. But you have um, a, acoustics goes in, and then into this black box, and then out the other end we get text. All right. And then we have two black boxes in between, and I'll call it, and this one I'll call a Hennick box, and this I'll call a Fred box. <laughs> okay? All right? Uh, well, yeah, okay. Yeah, higher and fire. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, I gather this is being taped for the known universe, so I didn't say that. <laughs> okay. All right. Anyway, now that I got you all awake, um, and then we need to talk about what the intermediate representation is here, and I'll get to that. All right. Um, but so um, um, when I, I like to talk about this as front end and that as back end, and um, um, Aaron, I think of as kind of front end, but I'd actually, I think Fred actually thinks of him as somewhere in here in the middle. All right. And and that's kind of where we're going to go. Um, so uh, the way the newbie talks work is that you get to say a little bit about. Uh, where you come from and so on. Um, and um, uh, you might notice he's a speech guy with almost no credentials in speech until very recently. Um, all right. And uh, I was sitting next to Joe Olive when, um, um, when this newbie talk was going down. And, and um, Joe, of course, comes from physics and from Chicago. Um, and um, there's lots of people in our area, I guess, who have a background that would share um, at least some part of that. Um, and um, I'll skip over um, the stuff that he's kind of interested in, um, because you can see how this is quickly going from the stuff that he's interested in into more of the stuff where I might be interested in. And, and I think you'll see the interesting mix. I really like this kind of interdisciplinary work, where you, you've got two people who come at it with with really quite interesting stuff, but quite different. 
Um, now, first off, let me try to describe the problems that we have to work on are interestingly different from um, the way that many of the problems the rest of the world has to deal with. I mean, I remember at one time, Chris Quirk, you were, you were at LREC somewhere, and people asked, why is it that Microsoft goes in the reverse direction of the, of the US government? And do you remember what you said? Huh? Broadcasting to the world, and they're interested in listening. Yeah, and, and that was a very memorable line, and it's kind of true. So now let me say, what's the difference between what um, the Army's interested in and what my sponsor is interested in? And the Army is actually interested in broadcast problems. So Gale is all about high resource languages, um, Chinese, Arabic, and English. I'll throw in high resource. And they're interested in uh, formal genres like broadcast, all right? Whereas um, my sponsor is interested in uh, low resource languages and informal genres, okay? Uh, so think about switchboard, telephone conversations, and um, low resource languages uh, um, say that you have no idea what the next crisis is going to be, but it'll probably be wherever you're least prepared, okay? Um, and when it happens, you will have no time to get up to speed, and anyone who knows anything about that language is too busy to stop for gas. Okay? Um, so the low resource setting, which is one we often get um, asked to work on, and we did ask a work on it last summer, is where you have um, what he calls modest, less than 10 hours of speech in whatever this is that, that would be transcribed. You have modest amounts of text, um, we'll call that, and you have um, maybe large amounts of, un, of, of unlabeled stuff. Um, and um, um, then last summer we worked on what was called a very low resource, which was less than that. Okay? Um, now, what I think uh, um, Aaron would like to work on is the no resource setting. He isn't there, but let's say that's the direction we want to go to, which is where you got nothing. Okay? No dictionaries, nobody who knows anything, nothing transcribed, and nothing not transcribed. Okay? You got nothing, all right? All right. All right. <laughs> and now the question is, how do you get something out of nothing? All right? Okay. Um, and um, yeah, uh, this is the way he says, how do you get something out of nothing? All right. Um, now, Aaron actually worked quite a bit on spoken term detection. So this would be where I give you the query is going to be um, an utterance, in, and then the documents would be some more. And what you're supposed to do is find out where that query appears in the documents. You get only acoustics. Okay. This is word spotting. Okay. Let me call it word spotting. He called it spoken term detection. Okay. But I, I think that this is common standard problem in their bake offs in this area, and he happens to play in that space. Okay. Um, now what I want to do is introduce a new problem, which is I'll call it spoken term discovery, which is here's the way I want to think about it. I'd like to create an audio snippet. I'll give you a podcast. It's an hour of speech. And I'd like to have 10 seconds of something. And after the 10 seconds, I'd like to decide if I want to hear the hour or not. And I'd like to measure your regret. That is, afterwards, no matter what you decide, I'll play the hour. And you tell me if, right, <laughs> about the false positives and the false negatives. Okay? So let me define that as a problem. All right? I could imagine this could be a problem, which if somebody did a good job of it, it might be useful for something. Okay? All right? And now the next thing I want to do is to tell you, oh, by the way, I'm not going to tell you what the content of the audio is, what language it's in, and you get no resources. All right? We're not going to, I mean, one way you might do this would be to say, imagine that this podcast is in a high resource language, and I've got a recognizer, and I could do all that. All right? So that has to be as a language. Um, let me not get into what resources are that I don't have. <laughs> okay? All right? <laughs> okay. All you've been doing is a piece of audio. I got an hour of audio set. All right? It's like a summary. summary. Tokenized. Yeah, I call it a snippet. All right? I don't want to get into what a summary is. A snippet I'm going to evaluate by your regret. That is, you, hear the, you get to hear the snippet, or it's an audio snippet instead of a text snippet, and then after you hear it, you get to decide, do I want to hear the hour or not? Okay? And then afterwards, we can, we can evaluate your regret. Okay? Right? That's a task now. What you're interested in. Well, okay, but that's the way snippets are, right? I mean, 
some snippets are easier to generate than others, and so, you're saying, right? So I just do have access to your is your judge a known quantity? Like no, of course not. All right, I'm going to tell you that in the real setting that I'm talking about. So okay, it's going to be after the next crisis, and it's whoever cares about the next crisis, whatever that is. So they hear right? the snippet they judge, they hear the whole thing they judge, and you see the difference between the two, right? Well, that would be one way. That's or one way of measuring right. regret. Another, right. Yeah. Another way would be you hear the thing, you, decide, you, you judge, then I make you listen to it no matter what you said, yeah. and then I'm going to measure whether or not you wanted to hear it or not afterwards. Yeah, right? but if you didn't want to hear it before and you didn't want to hear it afterwards, then there's not a whole lot of, you know, <laughs> and that might be the prior. Not a great okay. Right? <laughs> yeah. okay. Garbage in, still garbage in. But that's fine. But if they did think they want to hear it, and then they really regretted it in the end, then you did. Yeah, it, right? and you could see that uh, you know precision recall, or often precision is easier to evaluate than recall. Is it an online right? learning problem, or is it just a completely undefined problem where you don't have anything at all? <laughs> Let me go on to what we did, because we're speculating a problem. I mean, what I want to describe is the spoken term discovery problem, yeah. which he's going to argue is a kind of natural generalization from the detection problem, the word spotting. The word spotting problem is, I give you an audio query, and I give you a longer document, and just tell me where this thing occurs in the bigger one. The next one here would be, say, I don't know what the queries are. Can you find, tell me what, what would be a good query? Okay. So here's the bigger file, now tell me what would be good queries. Okay? And this, I think, so this I'm going to say is a standard problem where there are standard bake-offs and there's a lot of interest and so on. This is, I think, a new problem. Okay? I don't think people can do that. If you just start it, I can't even word segment the language I don't understand. Right. In fact, I'm going to give you a little quiz now. <laughs> okay? <laughs> right? I, mean, I, I don't think I can do this. Okay. So let me start with... Um, so, right, I mean, that was a great segue. So um, <laughs> each of these flags has some audio under it, and we're going to start with American English, all right? This is probably from Switchboard. Do you guys all know what Switchboard is? All right, so, um, and I think it actually, all right, so now um, I'm just going to play this. As a kid, my parents watching the Ed Sullivan show, that was really the big deal in our household, was the Ed Sullivan show. Yeah, I guess it was a Saturday night. Right. Yeah. So um, um, now, what he has in mind is to look for these repeated intervals, right? And and now they're saying, well, there's you know, n choose two intervals in the audio, and you kind of got to look through them and find the repeated ones and so on. We'll get to why that's interesting in a moment. But let me now go to so. Oh, well, here he's right, right here. Um, there's a bunch of things which I've argued in 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 other work, which I probably won't get to at the pace we're going at, which is, you know, the stuff I've done on dot plots and the Noriegas and all that crap, um, that we argue that um, things that make in text, that make an interval interesting, would be if it's long, if it's repeated, and if it's bursty. That is, bursty means it should be um, a lot in some documents and not in other documents. Okay, that would be good. Now, he's going to come up with some other things here which I want to sort of um, get to a little bit, that is um, that um, the repetitions tend to be a little more over-articulated than the other stuff. And um, there's also, um, because of this back channel, I'll get to, that is, there's, there's two parties to this conversation. And that what often happens is right near the really interesting bit, the back channel would say, could you say that again? And then, <laughs> OK, and then it does, <laughs> OK? And I think that kind of give and take is actually a pretty good hint. <laughs> OK? All right? Um, and, there, and, and where he's getting to is, is that the repetitions tend to be you know, with that kind of discourse structure. Um, so um, here I'm going to, these flags, this is Mexico, and that's somewhere in, um, all right. uh, no, it's not, but it's, it's, it's Arabic of some kind. Egypt, yeah, yeah. Um, so that tells you. Yeah, no, I talked with Maquela, no, me dijo nada. Pero si no me han dicho nada, yo no hablé con la Maquela y estaba de alerta. All right. How many people don't? Uh, how many people know it because they know Spanish? And how many you couldn't hear it, right? Okay. No. No, this is Egypt. All right. Yeah, me hablo Ah. Yeah. Shahat el milad, shahat el gawad. Eh, ahí. 
All right. So once I give you that hint, you could probably even get it, even if you haven't got a clue what they're talking about. So um, here's this. All right. So that was. Those are two repetitions of the same thing. They're not acoustically identical, but they'll probably pass even if you don't know the language when I call it out this way. Okay. So that. All right. Now this one. Are there any Spanish speakers in the room? None. All right. All right. So it's, I mean, we truncated in the middle of something, but you're saying it's, all right. But what I'm trying to get is that even the non-Spanish speakers would probably accept that that was a repetition, all right, of something. Now, the things we're looking for are pretty long. They'd be over a second. The second would be about as long as it say, takes to say University of Pennsylvania. All right, so it's it's more than a word, but I call it something about the length of a of a query if it was you know um, like to Bing or something like that. Okay, and um, that's what we're after here. So um, yeah. So if you don't have the repetition, then you just don't hear anything, or do you look up for those other signals you were saying, like the overemphasized? Uh... Well, so um, um, you you know, Aaron is a no nonsense electrical engineer. Okay. All he's going to do is look for repetition. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Um, that's enough. Okay. Well, can, All right. If I show you something like uh, 15 seconds, right? So this voice is, works very well. Right. But if I have something like uh, 15 minutes, yeah. Right. And then whether you will be able to find something useful or something. Well, that's a fantastic question. <laughs> now, so what Aaron's going to try to do, and of course, what's in this um, submitted paper to you know inner speech, mm -hmm. who knows if it'll be accepted or not. Right, is um, an evaluation on something like switchboard. And I'll describe a little bit about how it goes. But of course, what, you know, the switchboard is, you know, we could talk about is switchboard big, is switchboard small, all right? Um, you know, it's big enough to do a paper evaluation on. For a real practical problem, it's puny. Yeah, go on. Corbett really actually took a stab at this problem a few years ago, and he was doing it to listen to the radio and try to segment the music out. Yeah, and in fact, there are music references we're seeing in this area. And, and then I thought a lot of the tricks were how to speed up the calculation using fancy local sensitive hashing and stuff like that, right? So, so um, I started down that route. And then Aaron, and we figured out how to make this thing run fast enough for our purposes without actually getting that clever. Right? And, um, and the nice thing about not being clever is you can kind of prove how exhaustive the search you did. Now, I'm sure the cleverness would, would be valuable. Right? And then a lot of what we're getting into in the hashing would be to have a much better idea of what it means to be a match, what it means for an interval to be repeated. Right? And I'm going to say that's actually a very interesting question. I mean, that is, I can convince you all that was repeated, even if you don't know the language. Right? But what you guys are doing in your ears and stuff is really pretty complicated. Right? But I think this is an area that is not completely virgin territory. All right? um, and it is related to another problem, which is just how do you do deduping? All right? um, um, and suppose that I was to get all those podcasts, and you're saying, here I want snippets. But another thing I might want to do is remove the duplicates. And it would be one thing if they're duplicated by um, digital means, but if they're duplicated by analog means, that would be more tricky. And what if they're just the same song by slightly different, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, is this concert or that concert? Exactly that problem, and that's the problem I use for the study. And it works extremely well. It has a little app that ran on your desktop and found all the duplicates. Uh, right. So dupes at the order of sort of a music song are kind of, you know, that's kind of pretty well under control. Dupes at the level of a phoneme is kind of a disaster. Uh, the question is, what's in between? And I think of this a little bit problem like that battleship problem that is uh, in, in, you know, that old game battleship? The, the bigger the battleships are, the easier they are to find. Okay? Something a couple minutes is really quite straightforward. Something that's in the order of um, a second is kind of what he's going to focus on. And that, I think, is under control. Something, once you start to get, he's trying to go in towards a syllable, and at that point, it's really pretty hairy. So these are six seconds. Six seconds is, yeah, yeah. So he's, he's working on one second, right? Um, and, you know, my guess is that 
once you state the problem, this is going to be a little like, you know, a lot of the things I do, you state the problem and then lots of people come up with great answers. And I, think, I think you see what detection is a universal problem. It's a triple, at least English and Chinese of English that I know. I mean, there's a genetic algorithm that can detect all the sea level structure. So, do they use that? If you, some, I, th I thought the original problem is that combination too large. You need to constrain them to be a little small by having a chunk and chunk. Well, let me move on and then we'll see. You know, there's, maybe this is uh, more established than one. So let's see. What I was getting at here is, uh, so we're past that, right? Okay. Um, um, so he's got a whole bunch of ideas. Um, one thing is that we can make this problem a lot simpler. So in the, um, in the switchboard case, you don't tend to have a lot of speakers. And... Uh, maybe repeating, finding repetitions by the same speaker might be easier than finding repetition across speakers. I think at this point he's kind of relaxing this. But um, if we made that, we also could perhaps argue that these, the, uh, the recording conditions tend not to change. So the room doesn't change in the middle of the podcast. Um, and, you know, I mean, it could, but, all right. Um, and then here we're talking about the units we're after are sort of a second. And the longer you go, the easier this task is. Um, now he's trying to introduce the dot plots. And have all of you guys seen dot plots and stuff? But where you take a string like this, this is text processing versus speech processing. And he puts a, a dot wherever the letter here is the same as the letter there. And what your eye can see is these long off-diagonal um, things. And that's sort of a clue for um, repetition, right? Um, well, yeah, you could think of this as um, if you're doing dynamic time warping, this would be the search space for dynamic time warping. But you probably, it's a slightly different problem in that I'm not trying to find the path that warps this into that, all right? All I'm trying to do is to find that large feature, all right? And your eye is very good at doing this. Okay, your ears are very good at doing this, um, but um, you know, and, and we could come up with algorithms that could do it. But you know, somehow there's something about human perception that is pretty good at this kind of thing. Now, this is an attempt to do the same thing, except that he took in this case some some speech out of this Fisher file, and this is the same thing. So this is seven seconds against seven seconds, the same audio, each dot here, this is being represented as a bunch of capstral frames, and each dot is the similarity of each of the capstral frames. And then inside this box, we have a long sequence of, of capstral frames that are spot on. And um, let's see if I can. For $1 million. For $1 million. So that's two repetitions of, you know, you, you probably know whatever it was, but his program doesn't. But all right, you know. All right, but this is now um, a Kepstra representation is probably not ideal um, for this because the Kepstra isn't very good against uh, different speakers or different room acoustics. Uh, all kinds of very small changes could distort this in but bad general, ways. You don't get the straight line, right? I mean, this line here? Yeah. Oh no, that line is by construction because the similarity yeah. function. Yeah. Oh, oh, you meant that diagonal might not be 45 degrees. It probably isn't. Okay. Um, so now, comparing, no, no, this is the very same utterance. Oh, oh, <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm going to say the main diagonal is going to be there by construction when I take the same utterance and compare it against itself. Okay. And using a symmetric um, um, similarity function, that line's there. I'm not. I'm ignoring that. I'm saying this is the most interesting feature. Oh, and then note that this one and this one are the same feature because it's symmetric around there. Okay, all right. Uh, but um, all right. But what I'm getting at is that uh, the interesting thing is what's going on in that box. Now we could argue in that box is it spot on 45 degrees or is it slightly off? One of the interesting things is that the error from the 45 degrees is much smaller than I would have thought. <laughs> okay, um, and you know I would have thought that you could see you know 10, 20 percent off the main diagonal. You rarely see that when you're dealing with units as large as a, as a second. So all you mean is the same word, roughly. This, it's more than a, let me call it the same term. The same term. All right, it's the same term, and the speaking rates don't tend to vary by tens of percents. 
for at least for an individual saying the same thing. Now, within a syllable or something, they can vary by more than that. But when you get to something around a second or so, at that gross level, they don't vary by even a couple percent. So if you elongate one syllable, you make it up on the next one? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I mean, maybe there's some, um, at least the same speaker tends not to vary an awful lot. Now, I've often thought you might be able to use something like this as a sobriety test or, um, um, or maybe as a test for medical problems, you know. Um, but that is, whatever you are, you have, you know, it's like a fingerprint. And if you violate that fingerprint, there's something going on. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to think what on the main diagonal there's these sort of little fuzzy chunks. Are those just are those like periods of kind of static noise that is all kind of similar to itself? Um, it isn't quite static noise, but when we get to silences later, if you get into an area where everything looks the same, it's all these twisty little rooms, all right? That structure is interesting and important, but typically that big pattern there sort of says there's nothing interesting in there. Think of it as a whole bunch of function words, <laughs> okay? Yeah, the, the, the no, room that I went yeah. to. Yeah. Right. Okay. So um, that's probably not an interesting feature, but you want to not be distracted by it. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, here's, uh, oh no, I thought I already got there, didn't I? Where's that? Um, oh, so um, what he's trying to do here is to try to show that we can go straight from the text dot plots to these capstral dot plots, and it's really not a big whoop, all right? Um, hmm? um, and now what he's getting into is just describing that we're going to represent the spectrogram X as a bunch of frames, and each frame could be represented as a vector in the reals, um, and say a capstral slice, or whatever you want to do, and then he's going to represent um, this matrix Mij, which is this dot plot, as a similarity of, of this, and the similarities are, are by um, cosine similarity. Um, and then you're going to try to look for these long repeated intervals, those long diagonals. Um, and so to describe how to, first thing is to somehow, you want to do some filter that takes this to this, you know, it's a median filter, and then um, um, you're going to um, rotate it and apply a Huff transform, and you get this. Um, and then we're not interested in the main diagonal, and we're not interested in the symmetry, so we'll just take half the problem. And then it's kind of, this is a hill climbing problem. We're trying to find that peak, um, and, um, and, and he finds it. Um, and uh, now, now, that's the electrical engineering description. Now we're going to start to get some computer science in here. Um, that um, uh, what we describe is n square. And in fact, uh, Jim Glass and MIT guys have been doing pretty much what I'm describing. Um, and they have the problem that it works really well, except it's very slow. Okay. Um, and um, we're not going to change the n square. Uh, we started out with those fancy locally sensitive hashing and discovered that, that all we really had to do was to work on the constants for this, and it would scale up just, just fine enough for the problems we had at hand. And in fact, a bigger problem kind of going on is that I've always thought that if you wanted to make a problem work at scale, say on a big cluster or something, you, you're really restricted to algorithms that are maybe linear time or perhaps n log n, but n squared is out of reach. It now looks like n squared is maybe not totally out of reach if you focus on the constants. That you can actually do problems that are reasonably large as long as the constants are very, very nice. Um, now, um, the, the solution is sparsity. And it's sparse in every which way we can think of. And I won't go through all the ways in which it's sparse, but I'll go through enough of them that you get the sense that if everything is really, really sparse, the n square is OK because the cons constants are, are, are quite nice. Now, that can't be true at scale when you go big enough. But um, he's dealing with things that are certainly tens of hours. And doing it on the machines that academics can afford. Um, <laughs> OK. And, um, um, and it's running in um, less time than it takes him to figure out if the answers are any good. Um, um, so it's something like hours get done in, in minutes. Um, and, 
All right. Now, one of the ways that it gets sparse is um, I, in this, uh, this Hainik box and this Fred box, there's the intermediate representation, which we'll call the posterior gram. A posterior gram is this object. Are you asking something here? No. Uh, Just stretching? The posterior gram is part of the H block. So no, I'm going to consider the posterior gram as the output of the H box. So the input of the H box is acoustics, and the output is a posterior gram. And then I'm going to say the Fred box takes as input a posterior gram and outputs text. <laughs> okay? That's All right. Good for recognition before. Usually, when you combine those together, you get better recognition. So maybe it's a terrible design, but it's the Johns Hopkins design. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. I, I'm oversimplifying. Okay. All right. So let me describe what a posterior gram is, All right? which is that I've got time over here, and in fact time is digitized. We're going to have a frame every uh, cent a second, every hundredth of a second. Um, so this is almost a second, so there's almost 100 frames. And then... For each one of this way, we have um, 45 or so phonemes. And a posterior gram is just uh, um, the joint probabilities of these. But actually, it's really the probability of all the phonemes as a function of time. So that um, it's, it's for each frame, conditional on the frame, I get a, a vector of probabilities. They sum to 1. So these vectors this way sum to 1. Now. Um, um, here is sort of a hot to cold, so hot's big numbers, cold is small numbers, and you might notice that this is mostly cold. And typically on any vertical slice, especially in the middle of a phoneme, there's really only one thing that's at all high. All right? um, sometimes in co-articulated regions like here, between two phonemes, you can see two or three things coming up. Okay? And, um, and so this stuff is what I'm going to call very sparse. That is, typically on any vertical column, there could be 45 numbers, but there are hardly any numbers that are, say, over 10%. All right. I had to do that? That's that, yeah, this was the audio. All right. I figured that out so All right. You actually went and tried to read the posterior gram, right? You could have read the caption, but no. All right. But at least you probably convinced yourself that's what this says. It's right? interesting that the silence has, you, you don't have the joke come up with it. A, B, and the silence word. Uh, always I had to do that, basically. Yeah. So what happens with silence? Is it still something to want to use trimmed off the ends? Um, yeah, silence is just another phoneme. I, um, the um, sill. This, this sill is silence. Okay. And, and he probably trimmed the utterance so there wasn't any. Although there's got to be some in the middle of stops. Um, oh, but there's some other sounds for silence. Um, I've seen this with different phone, you know, things. But anyway, this is this is what we got, okay? Um, and that I'm going to call a posterior gram. And this is different than a capstrom, in that a capstrom would have um, significant mass um, all the way up and down. That is every number. Also, capstrom you have both positive and negative numbers. All right, the capstrom is a vector over the reals. This is a vector over the reals, but it's much simpler than than a capstrom, all right? Um, and um, one of the things that we're going to do, I don't know if he's got it right out here, but the very first thing we're going to do is to turn this thing into a, into a digital image, basically ones and zeros, and say, if, if any of the probabilities here are over some threshold, say 10%, then it's a one. If they're under that, then it's a zero. And that makes this matrix very sparse. Okay, yeah. You switched from no resource to we have an acoustic model of the language. Is this a different? This is just in English now. You want you're going to talk. Well, this thing was trained on English, but one of the world's views is to make English be the pivot language for all the world's languages. So, the fact that this so was now, trained. On, yeah. Right. right. Yeah. So now this is just changing the task a bit. Is saying that would be one way to do it. Now he's terribly embarrassed by that move, and you called him out, and he would be up here being very defensive and say, but. Um, yeah, but there is. He runs a cross-lingual experiment with this front end. The caveat goes away, right? Like if, yeah. If you got and, some Chinese call home data and did the same thing but used this front end, he's done. Yeah. So he's actually used the English front end, and I think I'll show you this later on the Spanish and the Arabic. And, all right. And you know what you find is that the sparseness property is better if you use the right front end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what happens with all these things when, you know, in Arabic they got some sound like a viewer fricative and we don't have one here. So it comes out, you know, a little viewer, a little fricative, and, right, um, and it isn't ideal, all right. 
it'd be better to do something else. Now what? Yeah. Well, you, yeah, but how do you get the universal um, phonetics? That is, every language, every dialect has got a different way of saying everything. Um, now, what BBN does is they have these self-organizing units where these things are not labeled. This thing was trained on some supervised labeling, and we're just using it on something it wasn't trained on. All right? Um, what? Hmm? For example. Right. Probably. Yeah, right. Okay. Now, another way to go would be what BBN's doing with self-organizing things, where you say you just train it on something, all right? and you don't even have any labels, you can still do this. Um, let me not go down that route, but those are the kinds of things that would very much interest people like Hanek and, and, and those guys. So just now you said the threshold for deciding between a 0 and a 1 is like 10%? Right. Now you're saying why that number? Why well, so what that's, oh, why so low? Why so high? You may have frames where We have a lot of these co-articular, yeah. I mean, on, in the middle in here, you know, any threshold you choose over zero will do it. But right? you, want to, you, want, you want to tend to have a, at least one one in every column. That would be good, yeah. And if, you know, if you have a lot of columns for everything zero, then that could lose a lot of information. And, and with, you know, 45, 50 phones, uh, you can't put, the, can't put the threshold too high if you want, a, if you want a one yeah. in almost every column. So um, when you take that binary thing and then you do the, um, you, you just form the gram matrix, you get this thing. And that million dollars is up there and it's still pretty obvious. Now there's these big blocks, these are annoying, all right? And those tend to be things like silences and fill pauses. No, but I thought the whole thing needs to be scaled by the energy. If you do that, they will be gone. Um, Plus, original one has that skin, I forgot, yeah. Well, we could discuss ways to get rid of it. His way of getting rid of it oh. is actually, all right, just to look for um, uh, long sequences where you don't have any change in phonemes. So if it's all the same, if it's a big block like this, just filter out the block, <laughs> all right? What we're looking for are diagonals, not blocks, all right? Now, you probably come up with another way, but maybe that's the same as what you just said, all right? Right. Um, but you know what you want is a diagonal filter, not a block filter. Now, um, um, Jim Glass uses dynamic programming. He doesn't look for the Huff transform and the and the and these long straight lines. Long straight lines are easier to find than curvy things. So what? Um, Aaron does is a combination of two passes. He uses the first pass to find the big long straight lines and then he refines it with a dynamic programming and this is much faster than doing dynamic programming everywhere because the long lines are almost fit almost nowhere. Where have you got a long line you can refine it later and get something that's a little more accurate. So you can see here the red line might deviate a couple percent from the green line but the green line is pretty. The green line is good enough to say there's a match in here and the red line can get a little better. So that's on, so once you find an off-diagonal stretch, you then apply the dynamic programming there. That's it, yeah. And in fact, what he really does is find, is look for green lines that aren't quite a second, but look for a whole bunch that are sort of half a second. And then, um, so this way, if there's a break in here, it's close enough. And then in that region, then go do the dynamic programming and find the red lines. So why using this kind of binary? You need to have sparkness? I mean, yeah, so the binary searches, you see, that doing the, oh. computing this gram matrix here on those binary that, matrices. That next slide is just a blow up of the, the red, right? That's right. So you take that red thing here, and now we go to the next slide, and that's the red area, okay? Um, now, I think what you were asking is, why did we want to compute this matrix over the over the binaries over, than over the reals. And the thing is that computing this matrix over a binary matrix, that's basically a manipulation on inverted files. Oh, I see. Right? So the coefficients on that are wonderful. They only depend on sort of the number of ones. It's even better than that. It's only the intervals on the ones. So if you have a long run length encoded, you can compute the, all those calculations I said on the run length encoded representation, which is a lot smaller than, than the reals where everything's dense. 
And the more sparse you can make it, the faster I can make everything. But if you do MLP with a lot of resource devoted, you have to data to train MLP. I don't need any training. No, for MLP, in order to do periodogram, you need to train. The posterior gram. Well, no, no. I just use the English posterior gram. Oh. I'm going to use the English posterior gram on Chinese. All right. It would be, it, and what happens is it's not as sparse as if I had used the right one. All right. But it's not as dense as a capstrum. All right. You know, it's kind of what my English ear hears of Chinese. Okay, it's not very good, but it's a lot better than, right? All right. Now, in order to publish a paper, he's got to have an experiment. Um, you may not like this experiment, but it's an experiment, all right? Okay. Um, we needed a truth set. We don't have a truth set. This is a problem switchboard wasn't designed for, okay? All right. Um, so what we've got is these two-party conversations switchboard. There's a lot to switchboard, too. There's this whole thing where, you know, the way it was collected is they took the subjects and they mailed in envelopes, and they each open up the envelope, and they tend to talk about what's in the envelope. They were told to, okay? And so the stuff that's repeated tends to be what's in the envelope, all right? And so the task we could really be thinking about is, can you guess what's in the envelope from listening to the acoustics? All right? But anyway. So that may or may not be a good test, but let me just say that's the way it is. Now, what he's going to do is for each, um, um, each of these speech cuts, he's going to try to get, by some procedure, a target phrase. And he gets to, in order to construct this test set, you get to look at the transcript. So all these things have English transcripts on them. Right? And so the way we're going to describe the, the, uh, the target phrase is that the target phrase has to be repeated. It has to have three uppercase letters in the transcript. Okay, the, trans, you know, the audio doesn't have uppercase or lowercase, but the transcript does. Okay? And so, for example, the Ed Sullivan show counts and all things considered counts. Okay? All right? it, it, it has to be at least a second long. We all know that from the answer set. And it should be the longest thing that met all those conditions. So there will be only one target per, per utterance. Okay? And that this will be, and now the task is, do whatever you can without looking at the transcript to see if you can identify the uh, interval in which the target's in, okay? And we'll count precision recall as to whether you get that. There might be other things that are repeated, all right, in the, in the audio, but we're, you know, this is the goal. These are these Easter eggs. Can you find these Easter eggs? There might be better answers, but, you know, the judge's decision's final, and this is the judge, okay? Um, and so, um, right, what he's getting in here is the judge's decisions are final, whether or not. So there might be other things, and they'll just be marked as wrong. Um, and so here he's trying to show that the two-pass method he has does better than the one-pass. And um, um, this is sort of, uh, you know, what, how, mu how many of those targets did he find? And this is how much, um, how many seconds does the judge have to listen to? So um, if you have to listen to 30 seconds of the audio in a 10-minute file, you're going to do pretty well, all right? But maybe you don't want to listen to that much. If you only want to listen to one second, you won't do quite as well, all right? Um, and here, what we're saying is with the two-pass, we can, we can um, be better on the analyst time or the person listening to the snippets. That is. A one-second snippet is harder to, to solve the problem than a 30-second snippet. Um, um, here he's trying to show, so you probably heard, there's this switchboard file. Here's the file number. And then this is what he, that task was to find that as the first choice. And here's some other choices. And they might be quite good answers, but this is the one we were after. So what do numbers change if it's not as artificial as it like, This seems to mean that. Your, the terms in the envelope are talked about really early on in the conversation? Well, we don't have early on or later on in the conversation. So what is the one second? Okay. Oh, one second means um, I'll give you one second of um, overlap. I'll give you my first choice overlap. Each, each thing I find is one second. So here, I'm going to ask you to listen to one, a, a snippet of just one audio, one second of audio. Not necessarily from the beginning. It could be anywhere. Right? It would be the output of his program. His program is going to generate um, these, these you know, ten, you know, top 10 matches. If you listen to 30 of the all top 30 matches, 
At the end of listening to that 30 seconds of audio, you'll, you'll find it with that probability. Yeah. Business template or typically the way the conversations go, oh, they want us to talk about blah. X. Yeah. And so a really dumb baseline, of course, gaming the test protocol right. would be report back the first n seconds of the file. So that's a good idea. Maybe I should ask him. Because <laughs> here he didn't really have any baselines. He's only showing his answers. <laughs> and you know, we're saying, well, his fancier method works better than his simpler method. But both of these probably completely blow away yeah. that answer. Right? Yeah. You know, that is, if we listen to the first second of the audio, um, almost with that formula, you get zero every time because they don't get to what they're doing for. Right? Probably takes them ten seconds or so to get there. Um, here's some other audio things, um, audio files, and um, here's one where this was the one that his program said is the Easter egg you're after. All right, that is, this is what the gold standard was, and these are ones that his program came up with as better answers. All right. Um, and so these are going to be marked wrong because the program says you've got to find this one. These didn't have three uppercase letters in them and stuff like that. Okay. His program, of course, doesn't know how to spell, right? Has no idea, right? So, um, you know, so you could you can argue whether or not, you know, um, but anyway, so here's two where the best answer is not in the top three, and so he's not sure. I mean the answer that the that the gold standard said he's after is not in the top three. So all three of the, these are all wrong. Right? But you can see that even when it's got things that are kind of wrong, that there's something going on here. So these, you know, these aren't even, um, this is showing that the acoustics aren't exactly spot on, but they're pretty close. So what is it that there is a good repetition it has more interest? That is, is, it, is it always the case? Well, so where we're going, what I'm really after here is to say that in order to do information retrieval in sort of classic Salton style, TFIDF, I don't really need the words. I don't need the text. Certainly Salton would say I don't need understanding. There's no natural language in what Salton did. I mean, he kept trying to find natural language, but he kept going back to information retrieval. Now I'm going to say we don't even need ASCII. Okay? All we really need is the ability to say, that this is the same as that, or this is not the same as that. And then you can compute TF times IDF. All right? So you could do information retrieval off of raw audio without any kind of understanding. All right? No AI, no, no resources. All right? OK? Maybe a lot of computers. <laughs> OK? <laughs> you got computers, we'll consume them. OK? <laughs> I said, he Nick hires them and Fred fires them, right? Okay, right? Okay. Well, you, you just said you could fire Fred. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, whenever I, I asked Eric Brill a couple of times, you know, that, that the thing about, you know, he does the more data is less, you know, better, you know, the whole nine yards, and he says, well, you know, why don't we just fire everybody and get on with it? Right? Do what's important, collect some data. All right. Now here I'm saying I don't even have resources. We'll fire everybody, if not, and even including the guys who collect resources. Okay, that's fine. But then I asked, you know, Eric, uh, you know, did he really say that? And 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 he sent back an email confirmation. Yeah, he really did. But I quote the email confirmation out of context. I leave off the smiley face. <laughs> okay. So all right. So you know. And what I'm getting at is he never fired himself. Well, maybe he did. But okay. Now, um, uh, so what we're going to do in order to play this on, there's call home Arabic, and this is one of the files out of there. And so I guess it's pretty much the same construction, but it's done with speakers of some other language. And what he's going to do is to use the posterior gram trained off of English and apply that to Arabic. Okay, so it's not as good, it's fuzzier than, you can see here, this is a fuzzier match than in English. But, um, um, and it doesn't have, the acoustic model doesn't have to be right, it just has to be consistent. So as long as it's always wrong the same way, that's just fine. Okay? Just, I don't want it to be wrong in random ways. <laughs> okay? Um, all right. Um, no. I'm not that well educated. Um, all right. 
the same way. Unhappy. Yeah. Unhappy. <laughs> That'll be fine. Okay. Good. That'll do fine. All right. Now, what he's getting at here is that the um, the the increased entropy that is because these things aren't always making the same errors in the same way. That leads to increased entropy. As applying the English to Arabic is not something I recommend, okay? But if you're in a tight spot, okay, you know, okay? Um, and so what it means is that these, these posteriograms aren't as sparse as they would be if you used the right one. And because of that, the constant aren't, aren't as nice as they would have been. So, um, oops. Go back here. Um, All right. Now, in this case, um, we uh, after we found this, we went around and tried to find somebody who actually knows this dialect of Arabic, and they told me that what he's saying there is the birth certificate and the marriage certificate. Now, what he's not using here is in that longer case. You notice that the way this thing works in the discourse is that the A channel is saying this, and the B channel knows it's important, so he says something like, what'd you say? <laughs> and then the A channel says it again. All right? That's, that whole interchange is really, I think, quite important. And he's not using all of that by any means. Okay? There's a lot more to go here. Now, we're just sort of, let me end with this, which is where it kind of goes off in, I think, that interesting tangent, which is that um, in these cases, each of these boxes is, a, is one side of one of the speech cuts from, I think it's from Switchboard. And um, we set it up so the A channels are all, um, are, are the first half, and then you have the B channels of the same conversations. And this is on one topic, and this is on another topic. So switchboard's set up by topics, and then you have lots of cuts on the same topic and so on. Now, each one of these boxes is a similarity matrix that's computed off of this, um, off of this ability to find intervals. All right? And what you can see is that um, um, everything in this box is, is pretty much more similar to itself, than, er, and everything here is pretty similar. And there's very little mass up here and very little mass in here. So it shouldn't be too hard to sort of cluster these things into topics with no resources. Okay? Now the next piece of this is that you might even notice if you squint a little bit that there's an off diagonal there. And that says that the A channel is more similar to the B channel, even within the same topic, than, than, uh, than any random conversation in the same topic. Okay? All right. Now, that signal isn't maybe as spot on as, as this one, and it might be more easier to see if we did it on the transcript than if we did it on the audio, the way he's doing it. But um, what I'm getting at is that I'm trying to say the sort of classic document manipulations that would go on in SIG IR can be done straight on the audio. Right? And this is sort of an interesting opportunity for um, uh, in interdisciplinary collaboration. How did he normalize here? Well, it's probably not that well because he's not an expert on that stuff, but I think he just did cosine stuff. Um, that's probably not the right answer, you know. Um, um, probably something more, I mean, the, I, you know, I'm bringing this up as more as this is a, this was sort of um, uh, the last end of his newbie talk of a, of a direction that he'd like to go towards that would cause collaboration with other people in our group that you don't, that you didn't even use last names, I won't go through with them, but this is a, a student of, of Fernando Pereira, um, and uh, Glenn is a statistician. Uh, Kerry Preeb, do you know him? Uh, uh, some of you do, I guess, but um, he would be not even in, in uh, he's not in uh, computer science, electrical engineering, and it's, it's uh, this is a clustering guy, a graph guy. And the, here he'd be thinking machine learning, learning to rank. Doesn't it should be a scrap cluster. It should be a scrap cluster. Use a graph cluster. Um, okay. So, you know, we could, um, um, this I just want to put out as subjective future work. Um, I don't think we've really, you know, th this is, but that's a direction that would unify much of, of our organization and probably could start a whole line of research. Where I'm trying to go at is, 
is that pretty much everything that we do these days in sort of information retrieval could work, I think, off the straight raw acoustics without actually any. So we can fire all the record, all speech guys, do speech without speech guys. All right? All right. Now, maybe they have something to offer when we have resources. All right? But the nice thing is that maybe we could do something without any resources. All right. So that's, that's what I had to say. Yeah. Would it not help to sort of bond the classes of languages that you're looking at? Like, you know, maybe you say these are Indic languages or Arabic languages. Yeah. So, for example, um, um, one idea that's a little like this is let's suppose that instead of saying English is the sole pivot language, let's suppose that I took all the language, catch as catch can, I'll take all the languages I happen to know something about and use each one as a possible pivot language. And then maybe you would try to say, I'll try to use some combination of them or the best of, all right? And, and in this case, maybe I don't need to know anything. That is, it would be obvious in the, post, the entropy of the posterior gram, which one knows, which one is appropriate for this guy, right? Right. 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 The sharpest peaks in the posterior gram is the peaks. That's right. And so, you know, instead of saying I've only got you know, English is maybe I'd have, you know, I have resources for a couple dozen languages, um, but I've got a couple hundred languages I'd like to cover. <laughs> and then some combination of the couple dozen could probably be um, reasonable starting points for the couple hundred. Yeah. yeah but just come back a little bit. I think that's the missing isn't clear. So you want to have short segment and then you see whether there's more interest in the photo remaining part of this original part of the Now, this plot only shows you certain part of the others has some overlap. You have the same kind of term that may appear from the beginning to the end. Okay. And that's what the plot shows. You mean that at the end, this last plot? Yeah. You're saying what's going on here? Yeah. What do these boxes mean? Yeah. These are probably like cosine matches, which means that there's lots, of, there's some intervals in there that match, but maybe in no particular order. Okay. Right. This is a sort of standard IR view of the world. Now, you know, a lot of people think that standard IR view of the world can't. It's just so simple it can't possibly be good enough. Um, but almost nobody's found a better one. Right? <laughs> I don't know. Am I saying heresy, or would people accept that? <laughs> No? Yeah. So how how sparse is your sparseness? Like, so if you pick it, puts your threshold to ten percent. I know you can't have any more than ten right. firing in any one frame. Right. Do you know what your average number of phonemes firing per frame? Well, I mean, I'm sure I don't think I, I I think I should know the answer. I'm gonna say it's it's way under two. So what right. I was expecting you to go when you showed me all these nice dot plots is uh, suffix arrays or suffix trees. Oh, I'd certainly started there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, like but then it turned out that I didn't need to. Um, so I first started implementing suffix arrays, all right, and went for those things and started trying to go for those long shingles. But um, the problem was I could never know that on the um, that um, 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 we were running into some problems where it was kind of a, I was introducing some heuristics. And I couldn't really know what the loss was of the heuristics I was introducing. And at some point, I just got frustrated and said, hey, this problem's really simple. You can actually just do the brute force calculation. Okay. All right? And the brute force calculation was fast enough that um, um, it didn't actually warrant that stuff. Now, we do have an expert in the locally sensitive hashing. And he's probably going to come back and say, we can you know, speed this up by orders of magnitude um, and be almost as good as what you've got. Um, the only real problem I have is I need somebody like Ping around to tell me what are the error bounds on the almost as good. Because <laughs> otherwise, the engineers would just come up with something that seems to work just fine in experiments. But I don't know what the bounds are. And so I got frustrated because, you know, it worked sometimes, it didn't work other times. It wasn't clear when it didn't work if it was because the heuristic was wrong or the implementation was wrong. It turned out both were often wrong. All right. Um, and then it was just a lot simpler to do the calculation exactly. And then you could debug the program. Um, and it seemed, it's, and I think it was that this was fast enough that I didn't need to go anymore. Um, but you're right. That is, if I really wanted this to scale up to billions and billions, I'd have to do where you're, where you're going. And, 
and I think we will, but we just we just punted right now. Okay. Yeah, I, I had gone down that route, okay. and and of course going down that route, you could get things that were really quite impressive. And but you have to deal with the ambiguity of each time slot, which is not present in the standard text case. And and uh, doing suffix arrays with ambiguity introduced all kinds of interesting opportunities, and I went down that route. Yeah, we're thinking suffix trees, but you know. Um. Right. Well, there's another way to do it, which is to go into a power space, a power set space. Sure. All right. So you can treat everything as unambiguous. So there's a way to sort of determinize it again. So you build each of those lattices. You take those sequences of lattices and turn that into a, a finite state machine, then determinize that, then build suffix arrays on that. Yeah. We could go down all this route, but I'd lose most of the audience. And in fact, there's very little evidence that it's worth it. Um, Right. Yes, I think so. That's going to be very expensive. Uh, well, we're doing the n squared matching here, yeah. Right. So it's very expensive, but. Um, but n gets longer, much, much longer if you're looking across documents, right? Right, yeah. If you... So the n squared is, that's the killer. Is the n squared is the n is the number of frames I have of all the documents concatenated together. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah. So that's a big number. You say, how can I think about that number? But. Um, um, he's going after it straightforwardly with, uh, you know, at least tens of hours of speech, and and it's running, you know, in in minutes on on the computing infrastructure that we universities can afford. Um, it's like it doesn't seem to be such a problem if you're careful with the constants, all right? That that what we're somehow saying is that n squared seem to be prohibitive at scale. And I'm saying, yes, of course it is at a big enough scale. But it's, um, um, I think we're getting to the point where one, imagine the following problem you have, which is this is a problem I had when I first joined Microsoft. I was saying, my god, Moore's Law just keeps cranking along, and we're getting more and more computing. And I can't come up with problems that are big enough to use up all, this, all, the, all the computers we have. All right? And I was somehow trying to restrict myself to this idea that the resources I would use would grow linearly with the size of the problems I had. All right? There's no way to consume all the resources I've got. All right? We can talk about how much audio you can have. It won't be long before you can buy a petabyte in Best Buy on your credit card for less than the price of dinner. Okay? You can already buy a terabyte for less than the price of dinner. Okay? All right? Now, um, we can say how many years will it be before a petabyte at Best Buy costs less than dinner? <laughs> okay? And I'd say it's about five. All right, All right. Now the problem is, why would you ever want a petabyte at home? Let me tell you another little problem about this petabyte. Okay. Hmm. No, no. You don't have enough bandwidth into your home oh, to fill true. up the petabyte. All right. So that is the di movable disks. That is the disks that I can carry. Movable media, things that I can move. Like I could pick it up from Best Buy and drive it home. Okay. That's getting um, better by Moore's law at a thousand x per decade. The wires in your home, that it's non-movable media, all right, networks, are only getting better 57x per decade. Okay? So the movable media has got it all over the non-movable media. Now, why would I ever buy more movable media than I could actually fill up by any means? All right? And the solution's got to be, we've got to get increased demand. And the simplest way to increase demand all right, would be, you've got to do it non-linearly. You've got to get people to start wanting n squared demand. Right. The demand can't grow just linearly or else we're all toast. <laughs> right. Well, the so, we're not toast. Well, we had this conversation before and I'm gonna say everybody's indexed to everything. All right, that's what I had to say. Thank you. Okay.